Today is Thursday, July 8th, 2010, at Shippensburg Bible School. Brother Matt Norton will be speaking to us on the subject, The Life of Lot. The title of today's class is Brotherly Love. Thanks, Eric. Um, well, good morning, guys. Have you, um, <laughs> you guys ever seen the movie Crocodile, Crocodile Dundee? Yeah, have you guys seen it? Yeah. You remember that, that, that bit where he's going to get mugged and he pulls out a little flick knife? And he goes, you got a knife, man? And he goes, no, that's not a knife. And he pulls it out he goes, that's a knife? And it's this huge one? <laughs> yeah, well, I was thinking the same thing. I said, that's not a cookie. <laughs> that's a cookie. <laughs> Look at the size of it. <laughs> it's something to nibble on while I speak. Now... Um, where have we left Abraham and Lot? Lot went back to Sodom. Lot went back to Sodom. So where were we yesterday? Did I do chapter 14 with you yesterday? Yeah, the captivity. How he was captured and then released. Well, here's the thing. You know, when... Abraham, this is. I want to talk to you about brotherly love. Now, first of all, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a story about Abraham Lincoln. Have you heard this story? <laughs> no, I heard Uncle Bob wanted me to tell you. Okay, so it's like this: Lot had been taken captive by Cade Olioma, and he was heading back to Babylon. Right? Yeah, he couldn't get out. He's chained like this, sorry for himself, and heading back towards Babylon, where he shouldn't be going. Only the rebels and the captives go back there. A lot shouldn't have been part of that. But Abraham races up and captures him and drags him back and lets him go free. And the story is this. Who, do you guys know who Abraham Lincoln is? Let me tell you, he was a president of the United States. Was he a nice one? Okay, well, he's a good president. Then. He came into town one day. And back in those days, they dealt in slaves and there was a slave market on and there was this beautiful slave girl who was being sold and getting bidded on. And uh, there was the notorious, infamous, cruel, nasty slave owner who was bidding for her. And Abraham Lincoln saw this and thought, I can't let, I can't let him take her. He'll treat her bad. Like he, he, he whips his servants. He makes his slaves work terribly hard. It would just be terrible. So he started to bid against him. And the price was going right up like this. And the cranky old slave owner in the end just said, if you wanted that much, you can have her and let her go. So Abraham Lincoln takes this beautiful girl outside the city and lets her go free. And she just, she's like, what are you doing? And he said, you're free to go. And she wanted to know, like, are you serious? Like, f- free to go where? He said, anywhere you want to go. What, really? Am I free to serve and to, to walk wherever I want and visit all the different towns around here? He said, yeah, you're free to go anywhere you want to. So she said, well, if I'm free, I'm coming back in with you. I'm going to serve you if I get a choice in the matter. So she actually joined herself with Abraham Lincoln and served him. And that's what Christ has done to us, guys. Is anyone here baptised? All you guys have been set free by Christ. When you are serving King Sin, he's a nasty, cruel slave owner. He doesn't give you a choice. You serve me or you die. You serve me, you're going to die anyway, but you're going to serve me. That's what he says. And Christ comes and captures you and says you're free. Now you have a choice. You have sin and death on one hand, you have Christ and righteousness and the eternal life and the kingdom on the other. It's your choice. Now it's our choice to serve whoever we want. Abraham had given Lot that choice and Abraham had had his heart broken because Lot had gone back to Sodom. What are you thinking, Lot? Lot had caused Abraham so much offence. But what did, what did Abraham do? Did Abraham get all narky and cranky and say, well, you're not my friend anymore. I'm not going to hang around you. Did he say anything like that? Even when God said to him, but don't worry, Abraham, it's not going to be an adopted son from your own loins you'll have your own son Abraham didn't think ha, I don't even need you anymore Lot God's given me my own son I see Abraham didn't even think like that 
Abraham never stopped loving Lot. Do you think Lot deserved to be loved? Lot didn't even want to be loved. Lot didn't even think he needed loving. But Abraham knew he did and never stopped loving. He wanted to show affection to his brother Lot all the time. And so he's always looking, even though he had very cause, good cause for deep hurt and offence and for the relationship to have broken down and to never be friends again. You're never sleeping over at my house again. Right? He couldn't, didn't have, ever have to ring him up again. Abraham wasn't like that. He had so much love. And what we're going to see today is that the same love Abraham had is the same love that the Lord Jesus Christ has got for us. Now, I've got a question for you. Where would Abraham have learnt all this love? Where would he have learnt to show so much enduring and patient love to another person? I'm going to have another bite of this picture. Good. Look at that. Mate, by the time you guys answer, I'm going to have that whole thing finished. From God and Sarah. Thank you. From God. Abraham had shown by himself, by God, incredible love. God had brought him out of Ur. He treated him in a patient way as he came through Haram all the way down to Shechem between Bethel and Ai. When Abraham went into Egypt, God was patiently showing love and care for Abraham. Now, what, has God, what sort of love has God shown to you? Give me an example of the love that God's shown to you guys. How do you know God loves you? Do you hear him at night say, as he tucks you into bed, I love you. No? So, how do you know he loves you? Yep, we're here right now. You're breathing. Are you above ground? Yeah, that's a good indication that God loves you. What else? Yeah, he's given us his, his son, the Lord Jesus. Now, imagine giving your son to somebody else to show you where your life will end up if you don't serve God. Man, that's love. Like, why would God care that much for me to give his son to go through all of that, to show what sinners and sin will do to a righteous man. If you don't turn away from sin, that's what's going to happen to you. Man, he, he loves us so much, guys. He wants us in the kingdom so badly. And you know what? When we then receive that love of God, we're meant to show that love back to each other, aren't we? That's how we learn to love one another, by the love God's shown to us. And we don't always, I don't know about you guys, but look at the person next to you for a second. Are they always lovable? Are they? I can tell you now, just looking at you, you don't all look that lovable. And you might think that about me too, but that's okay. But you think about this. When are you meant to love a person the most? When they're the most unlovable. That's the big trial for us. And Abraham found it difficult no doubt, he would have still felt the pain of Lot's offence and hurt, but he still wanted to love him. Now, it's so funny. We don't always love our brothers and sisters, okay? Especially when they upset the place. I mean, how hard is it just to go to the hall, be happy, be a friend, and do everything right? Why has there got to be always somebody like you or you over there to upset everything? Everything in this ecclesia was going really fine. And in our little ecclesial, happy little family friendship group, until you appeared. And you had to do this. Now, my brothers, like, we were at home when we were little kids, okay? And this is really funny because it was like that. There's me and Mal and Andy. And we were all sort of close in age, and we used to get on like brothers and fight and punch each other all the time. We had a great time. And there was one day there where we were giving mum a really hard time because it was pouring rain outside. Now, boys don't like staying inside, okay? Is that right? You want to get out, and particularly if it's raining, that's what better day to go out than when it's raining. And mum can't understand that. She said, but it's raining. Why don't you boys just sit down nicely and read a book? Or write a letter to a friend? And we're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Man, we're boys. We don't get out there. And she, she was like, well, what are you going to do outside anyway? And we said, we don't know. Dig some holes in dad's backyard. 
And she said, well, I've had enough of you. Just go. We didn't, I don't care. As long as you put your, your raincoat on. So we put our raincoats on, you know, but that didn't do anything because it was, mate, the rain was coming down sideways. It was just torrential. So we're out there. I take a shovel. Mal's got a hoe, you know, those big flat things. Mal's got a hoe and Andrew's got a pick and we're digging this giant big hole in Dad's backyard for no other reason than we just wanted to. And we're looking for worms. And anyway, the classic thing is, Mal's got the hoe, he's going, he's he's about to take this almighty big swing and Andrew sees a worm. But he doesn't just say, hey, Matt, Mal, look, there's a worm just there. (laughs) He goes... Look, there's a worm. And Mal goes, crack, straight across the top of his head with the hoe. Andrew goes, face down in the mud. And we're just going, oh, you idiot. We were so, like, I didn't feel one tiny bit of love and affection for him then. I couldn't care less, you you idiot. Get up. He's not even moving. He's face down the mud. Blood's coming out like an oil sump. And we were just, all we were worried about was, you messed up the whole day, man. <laughs> Mum, and I'll never forget, Mum, I, I, was, I, was, I was clean. Mum, Mal's killed Andy. <laughs> and he, he's all groggy, standing up, blood's running down his face. Mum comes out, she screams, all is wet in the car, straight to the hospital, stitch him up. You know, that's boys for you. But you don't always love your brothers, do you? And at the times where they're the most unlovable, that's when we should be loving one another the most. Now, what I want to show you guys today is, is what Abraham did. Now, just, just see this. Look at that. That's the sort of love Abraham had for Lot. And he didn't deserve it. And most of the time he didn't want it, nor did he even recognise or acknowledge that he needed it. Lot took, sorry, Abraham took Lot out of Ur, He refused to fight with Lot in Genesis 13. He risked his life. You're going to risk your life to save one of your your brothers or your sisters? To save Lot. Depressed. He was depressed when he'd lost him. Even when God said, don't you worry, I'll get you another son. He was still depressed that he'd lost Lot. He selflessly intercedes for Lot and he rises early to look for Lot. This is amazing. Because you and I, we're Lot and we don't deserve that sort of love. Now, what I want to show you really quickly is Hebrews chapter 13. Would you guys turn up to Hebrews 13, please? You're going to need um, um, some pens, pictures, books, what do you call it? Colouring in pencils, that's what we need. You need some colouring in pencils because I want you to take a few notes and colour in a little bit as we're going because Hebrews 13, did you know... Hebrews 13 is about Abraham and Lot. Hands up who knew Hebrews 13 was about Abraham and Lot. See, it's not a well-known chapter, but there's strong allusions back to Abraham and Lot's life. Now, I'm just going to ask you a question. Just think, just think. Right at the end of Hebrews, why would the Apostle Paul choose Lot as an example to wind up his message with the Hebrews. You're thinking, you're writing this letter to the epistle to the Hebrews. You talked about Melchizedek and Abraham and sonship and inheritance. Hebrews, Hebrews rings a bell. Why would you end up with a final exhortation and use Lot as an example? What do you reckon, guys? Another bite of this. I'm going to expect one for tomorrow as well. Any ideas? Yeah. In what way though? Give you a hint, guys. If you're a Hebrew, if you're a son of Abraham, if you're a Hebrew, what do you resist? What do the Hebrews stand against? The world, Babylon. Babylon, the city. Hebrews say, I'm not building the city. And I ain't living there. I'm getting out of the city. I'm going to live in a tent. That's what Hebrews do. These men in Hebrews here, who's the letter to Hebrews written to? 
but to Jews who had gone back to what city? Jerusalem. They'd gone back to the law. They'd left the ecclesia. They'd left the tents, the pilgrims. They left the ecclesia and they'd gone back to the law, back to Jerusalem. And they acted and they said, we're still Hebrews. You're not Hebrews because if you're Hebrews, you'd stand aside from the city. What better example now than right at the end of Hebrews? What's just about to happen to Jerusalem, guys? Right at the end. Yeah, we're in about the year, I think, in the late 50s or if not the late 60s AD. We are about to witness the destruction of that city. Yeah? Do you understand that? So Paul's saying, you've got to get out of the city. So in your mind, who would you go to as an example to tie up your final exhortation? Then go back to the life of Lot, who had to, if he wanted to survive, get out of the city. So let's go and have a look at this little section. Let's see if there are allusions to Abraham and Lot. Okay, verse 1, let brotherly love continue. Why should I love my brother when he messes up my day? Why should I love my brother? What does the next verse say? What is there as a good motivation for loving my brother? Or just to have brotherly love? You know, brotherly. Everyone seen that? No, you guys just over your heads. What does verse 2 say, guys? You guys can't read, can't you? What does the next verse say? Why should I show brotherly love? Oh, exactly, man. Like, man what, if, what if somebody came through and said, oh, yeah, I'm a Christadelphian. You've never seen him before. And you say, well, here, have a, t- have a cup of tea and some cookies. And then they left and you never saw them again. And you thought, oh. You ever wondered if you gave way when somebody's coming through a door? Ever gave way to an angel, somebody you never seen? Or do you just go, as you're coming, you know, bottlenecking to the door, you go, I'm first. <laughs> Have you ever given way to an angel? Have you ever met an angel? You should show brotherly love. Who in the Bible actually has entertained angels unawares? Abraham? Did somebody say Abraham? Is that what I caught? Just Abraham? Lot. What about Lot? Probably even Lot more so than Abraham because when those men came to Sodom at the end of the day, Lot had no idea that they were angels. Now, this is interesting because straight away the context of Hebrews 13 is going back to where? What chapters are we going back to? of Genesis. A little bit further on, when did Abraham entertain and Lot entertain the angels unaware? I'm not going to give you the answers today, guys. I'm just going to keep eating my cookie. I'm distracted now. All right, thank you. Genesis 18, 19. I always answer just so I take the bite. Genesis 18 and 19. Now, this is excellent. This is really good. So our minds are back there. But don't turn there. Just think. When we go through, this is where we're up to. So Hebrews 11. Remember them that are in prison, as though in prison with them. Those who are mistreated since you are also in the body. Now, it's a strange verse. Can I ask you, in terms of Abraham and Lot, who was the one who was in prison? Who was the captive? When was Lot captive? From the moment he left Abraham, he was a captive and he needed deliverance. In fact, this word's used of us from our enemies, from of us from death and us from our sins and the power of darkness. Look at that. Lot needed delivering. Second Peter says God knows how to, to deliver the godly from temptation. He knows how to deliver us. In other words, the only, you guys ever delivered anybody before? Rescued someone? Has anybody ever rescued anyone? 
Have you? What happened? So, so you rescue them. So the reason why you rescue somebody is because they can't get out themselves. Is that not correct? I mean, they need your help. Lot was a captive. Just imagine what it would have been like to be in Sodom. Would you want someone to come and rescue you if you were there? Man, if I made dumb choices like that and you hear about it one day, young people, I want you to fly out to Australia and redeem me, recover me, rescue me. Because if you don't, who's going to? If you don't show me love and you see me and hear that I need rescuing, who's going to save me? Well, Abraham was keeping his eye out to save his brother Lot. Now it goes on, it goes on in verse 4. Look at this. Let marriage be held in honour among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge whoremongers and adulterers. What does that remind us of? Who are the whoremongers and adulterers God will judge? Yeah, people of Sodom. And then the next verse says, are you ready for this? Keep your life free from the love of money or covetousness and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man should do to me. Now, the word covetousness there in your Bibles, you want to make a note of it. It is filio argos. It means lover of silver. Now, have you noticed there's two loves in this chapter? What are the two loves in this chapter that we've already looked at? Yeah. So, can you see what's being implied? What happens if you don't love your brother? What will you turn your affection and love to? The love of silver. You see that? Be content. Don't love silver. Lot loved silver. He didn't love his brother Abraham. Guys, if you are caught up in your educations and your wonderful opportunities at university and all the things that you're going to do and you love that, that's tantamount to loving silver, then you cannot have room in your life to love your brothers and sisters. If you don't love your brothers and sisters, your affection will turn to loving somebody else, something else, which is the love of silver. And this was poor Lot's situation. Man, he needed to get out of there. Now, do you know what the word content means? You know how the other day we looked at what it means to be uh, covetous and how we should be content? I love this. This is one of my favourite bits. The word content. Can somebody give me a picture? What would it look like if I was content? Somebody give me a picture. Do you want to give a picture of contentment? Exactly, relax. Kick him back, relax. My picture of contentment is a hammock with a coconut and a straw out of it. That's contentment. But do you know what, guys? That's not biblical contentment. The, the word there for content is a verb. How do you do contentment? It actually comes from a word, ready for this? It means to ward off, to build up the walls. That's odd. That's strange, isn't it? How, how is it at a content person? A content person standing there like going, come on, Roger, come on. That's a content person. You think, hold on, that's strange. Well, what, what, what is a content person warding off and saying no to? Back down, soldier. The world outside is telling us every day as it comes in and besieges our life and has an encampment around us, we're building up a wall because it's saying, you need more. You need this. You need the 120 gig iPod. You need that university degree. You need this and more and more of everything faster and faster. And we've got to build up a wall and say, get back, stay down, keep back. I'll fight you, bang. And we've got to keep punching the world in its head and kicking it and keep running away. And the world every now and then breaches down the walls and trips us over and crash tackles us, but we've got to keep getting up and kicking it in the head and keep running again. That's what sin does to us. Sin is going to breach our defences. And a content person is someone who builds up the walls and wards them off. Has anyone ever been to Gran's house, Grandma's house? Who's, who loves Grandma? And I love Grandma, right? Tell me the sole purpose for which Grandma was put on this earth. Food, exactly. Everyone knows. It's true. Absolutely true. So you get to see Grandma knock on the door. She sees you and it's like she hasn't seen you in a millennia. She goes, oh, it's you! 
and she's so happy and gives you this huge hu- cuddle and then she says, hello, Grandma, she says, have a cookie, puts food in your mouth and you always turn up accidentally on purpose at around lunchtime and she says, well, quite unexpectedly, would you like to stay for lunch? Well, <laughs> I never thought of that. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to stay for lunch. And then she feeds you. Have you ever had McDonald's at Grandma's? No, I don't think you've ever had KFC or McDonald's at Grandma's. She don't do KFC. She makes all her food, and it's good food. It's actually beautiful food, home-cooked meals. And you sit there, and you stuff yourself till you can hardly move, and then Gran says, but wait, there's more. And she gives you dessert, which she makes. She's made jelly, she's got ice cream there, and nuts and stuff. And in the end, she just keeps feeding and feeding to what do you have to do? You have to say, Grandma, I've had enough. I'm content, thanks. And you have to build up this wall around you of resistance because Grandma, she doesn't take no for an answer. The only thing she gets offended is when you say, I don't want your food, she can say, no, you can have fit one more in, you can have one more. And Grandma, I've had enough, all right, now back off. And you've got to tell Grandma to stand down. It's true. I think the world is like a great big fat evil Grandma that's trying to give us more and more of everything faster and faster but only the bad stuff like there's a nice grandma and there's a big evil grandma that's the world and guys you've got to learn the secret of contentment you've got to find contentment and ward it off so like we said before like that's my picture of contentment nice and relaxed that's not biblical contentment biblical contentment is on your toes fighting striking out, warding off, saying, I've got enough. And the world will say, no, you don't. Have some more. I've got enough. Classic picture, isn't it? I love Grandma. This used to be my favourite verse in the uh, New Testament, actually in the whole Bible. And the reason why it was is because it says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. But did you know, young people, what the Amplified Version says? And this was where why it was my favourite verse, and I actually had it. I had it up on my filing cabinet wall because in the Greek, it's like that. Five eyeball knots. One, two, three, four, five, down there. Where is right, There's the other knot down there, and I'll read it to you, okay? You read it as we go. Let your character or moral disposition be free from love of money, including greed, avarice, Lust and craving for earthly possessions and be satisfied with your present circumstances and with what you have. For he himself has said, I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake, nor let you down. Relax my hold on you, assuredly not. I love that verse. It was my favourite verse. I had it on my wall and I used to read it all the time. Did you know that's what the Greek actually says? There's five negatives. Paul says, not, 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 not. Why does he say not, 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 not? Here's the diaglot. Be not of an avarice. It's a greedy disposition. Be satisfied with present things, for he himself has said, no, I will not leave thee. No, no, I will not forsake thee. So you're reading that verse. What's the first question you ask yourself? I have another bite of my cookie. What are you thinking when you read that? Has anybody heard of that little three lettered word that starts with W and ends in a Y and has a H in the middle? What's that word? A oh, Y, that's right, I remember now. I go, Paul, Paul, because you study, you guys are Bible students, right? You look at that and go, why did you put five negatives there? And did you know there's this same principle throughout the Bible? To Joshua, Josh, uh, Samuel rather, in the Psalms and David, where God says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. But it doesn't appear in that same form. Now, you guys are good Bible students, aren't you? You want to understand God's word? Five times in Hebrews 13, he tells us he'll never leave us. Now, where is the context of Hebrews 13 
leading us to? Where have our minds already gone back to? <coughs> Where, guys? Are we, have our minds in Hebrews 13 gone back to the days of the kings? Days of Nehemiah? Days of Solomon? What days? Abraham and Lot. What chapters? Genesis 18 and 19. That's the context. We're going to find there's answers for why Paul did this in Genesis 18 and 19. Let's have a quick look before we run out of time. I beat you there. Look, I'm already there. Genesis 18. Do you guys know what Genesis 18 is about? I'll quickly tell you. Genesis 18 is about the time when Abraham entertained the angels and showed them amazing hospitality. And they've finished their food and now Abraham takes them on their way. And as they're walking, the angels are talking to themselves and Abraham's evidently a little bit behind. The angels are talking and they say, hey, you know that project we've got? We've got to go down to Sodom and see how bad it is and we might destroy it. We should really tell Abraham what it is we're going to do. And we've got to tell Abraham because, well, he's faithful. And he's promised to teach his children the way of truth. And he's going to make sure they learn justice and judgment and righteousness. We'll tell him. They turn around to Abraham and they say, guess what we're going to do, Abraham? It's highly likely that we're going to blow Sodom and Gomorrah out of the ground. And Abraham goes, oh, phew. For a moment there, I thought you were going to blow the planes of memory out of the ground up where I am. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> I'm safe. Is that what Abraham said? I don't think so. Abraham's mind immediately goes to his son in the faith, his brother Lot. And he thinks, oh my goodness, that's terrible. Because back there in Sodom is the ecclesia. God... You wouldn't kill the righteous with the wicked. You, that'd be far from thee, the judge of all the earth. You wouldn't do that. What if there were 50? Because he thinks in his mind there's Abraham, there's, sorry, there's Lot and his family and the ecclesia that went down. I mean, there's so many people. I'm like, there's got to be 50, I guess. After all, he had 318 born in his house. So that means they had heaps more couples than that. Abraham had possibly over a couple of thousand. Lot's got at least 50. And God says, the angel says, look, Abraham, if I find 50, of course I'll save the city. So what's Abraham thinking then? Exactly, well, there's left in 50. Now, I'll just put it up for you so you can see this. Check this out. He says, if I find 45, what does God say? Somebody read that last line. I will not destroy it. And then he says, well, what if there's 40? And God says, I will not do it. And what if there's only 30? But God, don't be angry at me. Please don't be angry. What if there's only 20? I will not destroy it. And then he says, I'll ask once more. I'm not going to talk again. I'll shut up, I promise. What if there's only 10? See that? How many I will not to there? So in answer to our question, I want somebody to answer this. In answer to our question, why did Paul put five negatives in the Greek of Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5? Yeah, he's quoting Genesis 18. What an example that is. How many, by the way, were there 10 righteous in the city? Well, what do you mean? How many were there? How many? One. Just one. Mrs. Lot didn't want to come out. The two daughters weren't very faithful at all. They actually they gave birth to nations who ended up being great persecutors of Israel. The only righteous one, the Bible says... 2 Peter chapter 2 was Lot. So there wasn't enough in the city to save and salvage the city. But hold on. God said he's never going to leave us. 
Well, what does that mean then? If you're the only righteous one left and you're in a really bad situation in life, you wish you could get out, will God leave you there and destroy you with the wicked? What did God do with Lot? He actually took him by the hand and his wife, who didn't deserve to go, and his two daughters, who didn't want to go either, and he dragged them out of the city and he saved them. Why? Because like Paul's saying, he will never, ever leave you. Now, the exhortation in Hebrews is simple, isn't it? To all the Jews who have gone back to Jerusalem, guys, back to the law, back to their old way of life as young people, straight after Bible school at Shippensburg, you go back to your parties, back to your friends at school and hang out with those druggos. They're really good friends though. You know, man, they're really really good friends. Yeah, I'll come to the party. They go back to that life. God says, you've got to get out of there. I'll never leave you. But who wants to say, I'll choose to be like Lot and I'll just stay here and I'll wait for God to come and pick me up and take me out? The lesson of Lot's life for us, guys, is we've got to stand up, open the door and make a go for it ourselves and get out of there. God's with us, but let's not try his patience. Let's not presume on his mercy and grace. Let's do something. Have you guys all marked that in? You put Hebrews 13 verse 5 beside Genesis 18. And in Hebrews 13, have you put Genesis 18 there and coloured in the five I will nots? You've got to mark that in, guys. It's very, very, very important. It's the most important thing on earth because we get, we, get, we get scared about tomorrow, don't we? We don't know what's going to be ahead. Are you guys scared that maybe God will leave you? Maybe he won't be there with you to strengthen you in all your trials of life. I mean, I don't know what's on the tomorrow. I remember this story about a young, a young fellow that did some mission work in a quite a primitive culture. No email, no access to computers. And what he had to do, he got from his girlfriend and his mum letters. And they decided because the postal system was really very ordinary and inept, they would number the letters. And so they numbered all their letters and he said when he got home, he said, well, the first week I received letters one to seven in the first week. And then it was a two or three week break and after that I received letter 22. But I knew when I read letter 22 that everything at home was fine, everything was okay. He said, I didn't know what was in letter eight through 21. I just knew that when I read letter 22, everything was fine. That strikes me, guys, young people, as a classic picture of our life. You know, we've all received letters one to seven, haven't we? We know where we've been. We're here thus far, but who knows what's in letter number eight? Do you guys know what's in letter number eight for tomorrow? What's going to happen to you tomorrow? Do you know if you're going to fall ill? There's going to be a tragedy. Do you know if you're going to flunk out of school? Do you know if you're going to get that job? What's ahead in letters number eight through 21? So we don't know that. That's the future. God God doesn't promise us in the interim a peaceful life with no strife. It's going to be difficult. There's challenges ahead of us. Guys, we're in the last days. We're playing A grade now. We've got to actually step up. But I'll tell you something. It's like a heavenly father's a postman and he's given each of us in his own handwriting letter 22. And I've got mine here. You want to know what mine says? Mine says this. It says, Matt you'll be happy to know that everything turns out just fine. And so my son made for me letter 22, which I keep with me all the time in my Bible. And it says just that, Matt, everything's going to turn out just fine. You're going to be in the kingdom. Your family's going to be there. I want the kingdom more than anything else on earth, guys. You should put one of those letter 22 in your Bible because you don't know what's in letter number 8. But God's already told you, each one of you young people, that he desperately wants you to be in the kingdom and he's doing absolutely everything possible in your life at all times in the best way to make sure you're going to be there. And he's not going to stop until you are going to be there. What are you, what, what are you actually doing in your life now making preparations for? Think about those things, the choices that you're making. Letter 22. Everything's going to turn out just fine. 
And I think Abraham and Lot would have had a, well, particularly Abraham, would have had a struggle just believing that about his brother. But he rested in the faith in God. He trusted in his heavenly father. He always looked for an opportunity to redeem his brother Lot and he never, ever ceased loving him. Now, guys, are there any questions? Big pardon? I don't know, look at that. It's half eaten. Who would give somebody a half eaten cookie? <laughs>